the man standing right from, right from me is Martin Reiche. Martin Reiche is a former computer scientist with Karlsruhe Institute for Technology. He went to study media art and now is a self-employed media artist covering space perception, digitalization, power relations, and minimal aesthetics. That sounds a bit arty, and it will be arty. <laughs> In the best way. In the best way. <laughs> His work uh, was seen at exhibitions, festivals worldwide, like in Spain, in Russia, and of course in Germany. For example, he used a border barbed wire fence to accommodate Wi Fi modems and connecting people by a fence that's not supposed to connect people. We're living in times where there's architecture that's purpose only seems to be to disconnect people or for surveillance, for surveillance purposes or both. And Martin Reiche shows how to connect uh, this architecture with the arts and thus reclaiming them against their actual purpose. Please welcome Martin Reiche. Oh, I'm sorry. I It's been late yesterday. The, uh, <laughs> the closing ceremony will be streamed into this hall, so you can just stay sit uh, until 18.30. Now, Martin Reiche, try this with the applause again, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming, um, especially against this other talk in the other room. It's um, quite a hard... Um, yeah quite a hard thing to compete against that. Um, yeah, my name is Martin Reiche. I'm from Berlin. I'm a media artist. Um, we just had that whole introduction thing. Um, so I'm just going to talk about what this talk will be about. It's called Surveilling the Surveillers, which is maybe more of a provocative call for action than really an actual description of um, what I'm going to talk about. But don't run away because um, you will understand in the end why I'm giving you this disclaimer right now. Because I will talk um, about current important critical topics um, that are important for my own practice. And I'm going to give some examples not only from my own artistic practice, but also um, from uh, other people's work that deal with the same topics. And I think it's always important to, to really understand the context where um, artistic work is uh, situated in, in order to understand um, the work itself. Um, I will also talk a bit about a modern form of activism um, and that I see computer science and computer programming as this modern form of activism. Uh, I will talk about regulation of technology and uh, the policies concerning technology and the institutions that make these policies. Um, I will also talk about quantification of the world somehow and I will finish with a something like a closed formula to describe the whole world, which sounds a bit... Um, impossible, um, and it actually is, but, um, well, that's where we'll be going, and we'll see how that um, will evolve. So, uh, my background, uh, we don't really need this again, um, but I want to tell you a little bit about some works that I did, because it's, uh, it's a variety of works that I'm dealing with, and a variety of topics. For example, um, topics like electronic waste, digital footprints, uh, complexity, um, visual or conceptual glitch, generative systems, generative architecture, cybernetics, belief systems. So there's, it's a lot of buzzwords somehow that always come up when you talk about critical art. Um, but before um, starting with that, I will tell you a little story, or I'm still going to talk about this concept of the Laplace's demon, um, which will be important for the general scope of this talk. Um, Laplace's demon is, has been postulated by Pierre Simon Laplace in 1814, and it's basically an articulation of scientific determinism. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to, I will quote this, um, he, Pierre Simon Laplace says, um, an intellect which at a certain moment would know all forces that set nature in motion and all positions of all items of which nature is composed, if this intellect were also vast enough to submit these data to analysis, for such an intellect nothing would be uncertain and the future, just like the past, would be present before its eyes. Um, I will just leave this here and I will come back to that at the end of the talk to have something like a closed loop for this talk. and. Um, 
I will start to talk about uh, critical topics, which is topics that um, are right now interesting, especially also for the, the arts, which deal with um, technology or with technological artifacts. Um, and I will just start with something that always comes up. It's uh, surveillance, of course, uh, surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, I'm putting this here together, not because I think it's the, um, they are identical things, um, but because both topics um, have been, I would say, far too widely discussed already in an artistic context. So um, I'm just going to show you some examples of artistic works that deal with um, surveillance and reconnaissance, um, and especially works that are important to me. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just said that I'm not going to talk that much about surveillance, which sounds counterintuitive if I talk this, um, call this talk surveilling the surveillers. Um, but it's not really the optical surveillance like taking a nice um, panchromatic shot of the Earth's surface that I'm interested in. Or this is a work by me, it's called Scan Lines of Aleppo, um, that's also consisting of panchromatic satellite imagery from a former classified, now declassified US um, reconnaissance satellite um, used by the military. Um, they now have a vast archive where they publish these um, old um, well, data from, from overflights. And you can basically take them from different times um, in different years. You can stack them upon each other, which I did here. And um, I, I was also producing this work. Um, it has a glass um, on top of it. And I was re basically engraving the, the flight path of the satellite in order to give somehow a physical um, idea of the trajectory of an actual satellite um, that is flying over the Earth's surface. Um, I'm also going to talk a bit about uh, electronic tracking, especially electronic tracking um, through unique identifiers. So, well, that's um, SIM cards, at least in Germany. Um, they, they are mapped to a um, person's identity by law. So if you buy a SIM card, you have to give uh, away parts of um, the data about your identity in order to be allowed to have one. So these SIM cards are unique identifiers to your person and make it very easy, of course, to track you and your behavior and, and so on. Um, and I just want to start with one work of friends of mine that um, well, at least Danja was here at this conference. He's now not here anymore. Um, this work is called Prism, the Beacon Frame. and. Uh, it's a work that takes the, this idea of, um, I have a SIM card and it identifies me somehow. Um, and it takes also the idea of the authority that actually is allowed to put um, cell phone towers. Um, it takes this, it, they just create their own cell phone tower and they send you messages when you come close to the cell phone towers like this. Welcome to your new NSA partner network. Um, so this is basically a um, well, produced IMC catcher that um, just tells you very decently that, um, well, you're just being um, surveilled, in a sense. Uh, it's, a, it's a work that's been also legally problematic, of course, uh, because usually in Germany you are not allowed to do these things. In an artistic context, you have a bit more freedom um, to deal with these kind of things. So that's maybe an example for well, surveillance um, in a sense that you already um, already know. It's the uh, no longer in effect, actually, directive uh, 2006-24-EC, which is a well European Union um, 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 directive uh, that we just tended to call the Vorratsdatenspeicherung. And in Germany, we now have, unfortunately, since December 2015, the Gesetz zur Einführung einer Speicherpflicht und einer Höchstspeicherpflicht für Verkehrsdaten. We just heard a very interesting talk in um, the first hall also about how this now developed in the last um, couple of months um, and also the last couple of days, unfortunately. And um, yeah, you can see this as the national predecessor of this directive. So here I put this in the same, in the same um, basically corner as also the artworks um, about surveillance, because I think um, one thing is very important is, is these things about policies, because policies are basically the, the they are the rules that define um, how we live together, but they are also the, the rules that um, are mostly, well, problematic um, for us as um, 
people working in technology because you somehow have to um, adhere to them even if you do not um, ethically agree to them. That's another maybe nice example for that. Um, biometric surveillance is something very prevalent right now, um, especially taking fingerprints, for example, um, at airports, international airports, or getting um, DNA, um, um, having a DNA screening of, uh, of your person. Um, and these things are usually right now, unfortunately, mostly taken from immigrants, um, and especially uh, we have this, um, basically this problem in, um, in Germany with the uh, influx of, uh, of immigrants where at, uh, well, the first thing of course that came up was, well, how do we identify them and how do we make this um, basically as smooth as possible, which of course the easiest way to do it is just to, well, take as much data from the people as possible, which is of course ethically a bit problematic. Um, uh, yeah, a lot. Um, so, Another topic that falls in this category of surveillance and reconnaissance is um, predictive analysis. And that's not the computer scientist in me speaking because that's where I'm coming from. Um, I was dealing with uh, machine learning and distributed um, algorithms. So predictive analysis is something that um, I think is extremely important. And to give like three examples of predictive analysis is, um, for example, prediction of um, user behavior, which goes directly hand in hand with user tracking, um, but also market prediction um, through, for example, if you have a high frequency um, trading algorithm, um, you want to predict the, the future um, development of the market to make very fast decisions um, on these predictions. And uh, yeah, these brought us uh, a lot of problems lately. Uh, this is an example for such a problem. Um, they're usually called flash crashes, which is um, a very uh, short time frames in which some stocks lose uh, a lot um, of value. Uh, this is, I think, the stock of natural gas around 2011 in June. Um, and what you can see here in this, like, just uh, the stock market um, development over time, and this is just a couple of minutes. This is um, 1940 until 1955, so that's 15 minutes of market movement data. And you see these nice oscillations that get worse and worse, so there's something that doesn't look very natural. Um, and at some point, it just ends in a crash, which is, I think, a loss of 20% of equity for the company, which is quite a lot. And it's actually in 15 seconds, happening around 15 seconds. Um, so yeah, predictive analysis is a problem. And um, you can go even further and say, well, um, predictive analysis also right now is used for um, crime prediction. So there's companies selling um, software to, um, to cities in order to predict where the next crime uh, is supposed or is probably happening and take some precautionary measures to um, make sure that the crime is actually not happening um, or just, well, go and, and catch somebody and just see what happens. Um, so yeah, that again, of course, is ethically problematic. <laughs> So, um, yeah, coming to the next topic would be regulations and policies. And especially enforcing policies on citizens. What does that mean? Um, well, the easiest um, way how to understand it is laws. Um, so the laws of a country are basically the easiest and the, the, the well, easiest to comprehend way to enforce a policy uh, upon your citizens. But uh, it's not only these kind of laws. But then you have uh, um, some, some policies, some regulations, which are a bit also harder to grasp or harder to get access to. So you really have to do a lot of research to understand what is actually going on here, but it still has an effect on you. This, for example, is a uh, NATO document which shows the basic military allocation for um, the radio frequency spectrum. And I'm showing you this because it will get a little bit um, more important for a work that I did on some uh, research on these um, military regulations for, uh, for the radio frequency spectrum. And I'm staying in this realm of radio frequency. I'm actually gonna show you if that works. No, I don't have the other screen. That's very nice. 
show you some example. So this is a recording at uh, 13.3 megahertz. The recording is somewhere in Germany, and uh, it's, it's the so-called Chinese Fire Drake uh, uh, AM jammer. It's uh, a jammer that is used by, or has been used. Um, by the government of the People's Republic of China, and they use it against um, other states' um, uh, radio uh, stations. So they basically use it to jam the stations of, um, of well, of other of other countries. For example, this was the, the Sound of Hope Taiwan radio, which you can't really hear anymore because the only thing you hear is this strange Chinese folk song. Um, and that's somehow also a way to enforce a policy on your on your people by well just blocking access to um, something that the people could have access to if you wouldn't enforce your policy on there. Uh, that doesn't work now. Um, another example here is uh, an artwork. Um, it's an artwork. It's called All About You. It's by. Yanez Yanja, Yanez Yanja, and Yanez Yanja, which is an artist group from Slovenia. That uh, it's an artist collective that at some point decided, as an artwork, to all change their names to Yanez Yanja, who is uh, a former Slovenian prime minister. So they now all have the same name, and it's the same name as the prime minister, um, which is in itself a, quite an interesting work of art. And uh, this is one of their newer works where. Um, they basically had um, this, this contract with one Slovenian bank where they could, whenever they lose a, a credit card, they can just replace it with a new one. And they can at the same time also just specify the, uh, the photograph that they want to have on their, on their credit card. So they decided to make, well, how many are that? I think about 120, 150. Um, to reproduce the, actually the Slovenian passport of one of the members of Janez Janja. And there actually exist three of these collages um, <laughs> for all the three members of the, of the artist collective. And I think they're not yet complete or some got lost. I'm not sure what's the reason that some are missing. Um, but it's a nice way to subvert um, this, also this idea that um, this, there's this policy that also says that, well, every, um, there's like one identity mapped to one person, especially if you think about what a name means. Um, now you have four people having the same name, also kind of having a very similar, at least these three people, kind of similar biography by working together. So if you see a work of art, you don't even know who it was that, um, was the first, maybe the first person that came up with the idea. And even if they tell you, you don't really know what that means because everybody has the same name. It doesn't really make sense. Um, so yeah, thinking more about policies, um, another interesting, important work here is uh, Lupo for All by Paolo Siria. He got, um, I think, the Gold Nika in 2014 for this work where um, he basically sold for very cheap, I think for 99 cents, these certificates of incorporation um, from some companies in the Cayman Islands. Um, I think basically all companies in the Cayman Islands. They are, of course, not valid, but they also, which is interesting in these certificates, they don't really need official stamps or anything. You can basically also incorporate a company there extremely easily. And of course, it's a loophole um, for tax evasion that's used by, by companies worldwide. And he wanted to make it more accessible to, to people. So he just thought about why not, why not sell that for like a dollar um, to people or like a dollar, then you can download it and two dollars or three dollars, and then you get um, a real certificate out of it. So that's also what, quite an artistic way to, to deal with um, policy. And uh, probably another quite prominent uh, picture is uh, this of the Liberator gun. I think you've probably all heard of this one. Um, it's been around for a couple of years now and um, popped up on, on the Pirate Bay and it's basically a completely 3D printed working one-shot gun. And uh, yeah, it actually has a predecessor, which is interesting, which a lot of people don't know, which uh, is also called Liberator. It's called FP45 Liberator, and it's from World War II. And uh, it, had, it also was a one-shot gun, 
And uh, the idea there was a little bit different, though. It's, uh, it was produced for around two US dollars, so it was a very, very cheap, cheap gun, just created out of scrap metal parts. And it had one shot, and it was given out to resistance forces in the occupied territories. And the idea was that one shot is enough to kill an enemy and take his weapon so you can basically rearm yourself. Hence the name Liberator. Um, so I was talking about enforcing policies on citizens, um, but there's not only citizens, but there's also the others. Now I'm saying the others, the non-citizens of your country. So enforcing policies on others um, is also obviously an important um, thing to talk about. And I'm just gonna show you one picture um, which sums up enforcing policies on non-citizens, uh, which is the US drone program, um, well, bringing democracy to a country near you. So uh, another topic is the obsolescence of um, political borders. And that's also now where, where my work um, comes up. And uh, I was very happy um, to be able to take part in a project that was initiated by two artists that gave a talk last year here. It's the artist collective Kairos. Um, they gave a talk um, because they went to, to Ghana to a site um, called Aboblashi, which is an electronic waste dump. It's actually the, I think right now, the biggest electronic waste dump in the world. And uh, they were collecting hard drives. They were buying hard drives, basically, from this um, e-waste dump. And it's quite cheap. You can get a hard drive for a dollar, and they sell them usually in bulk, like you get a big box, and you supposedly take a big box with you. And they also tell you the story that um, usually people come and buy, well, a lot of them. Not one box, but 20 boxes. Of course, not to have, in the end, these old hard drives, because they're, like, from a technical perspective, quite useless but because uh, of the data that's on the hard drive that's potentially useful because you can use it um, for abuse schemes um, against the previous owners. So um, they brought 22 hard drives back to Europe, um, to Austria, and then um, did a forensic analysis and were able to recover um, a couple of, I don't know, it was something about 200 gigabytes of data. And it was a bit too much for them, so they decided to give it out to other artists and to, to somehow deal with it, to dig through it. And we somehow did, and it ended up in having, we had a nice exhibition about electronic waste and the remainders of, of data that uh, you will find in this electronic waste. And uh, just saying that what I've seen cannot be unseen. Uh, you don't really want to deal um, or to dig through the private data of uh, a lot of people that you don't know, um, especially, um, because I was interested, of, especially in video and images. Um, yeah, I made a work out of it. I will tell you about it in a second. Um, what we also did in this project was um, to try to get a, an understanding for um, what are the problems of this whole electronic um, life cycle. So before you have your phone in your hand, of course, well, it was assembled somewhere. And before it was assembled, um, you needed to have the resources um, in very physical terms, the, the rare earths that you need to, to produce um, the components. And you have, to, you have to mine them somewhere. And usually it happens in countries which are rather poor. And it happens under extreme conditions. Um, people uh, that work there are dying very fast. Um, so we created a project that tries to map this, um, well, what is behind the smart world, like all these this life cycles of electronic, um, electronic components, um, and exhibited at Ars Electronica this year. So that was actually quite a nice project, also to just get an overview that this is really a global problem and a global phenomenon. Um, yeah, what I wanted to tell you is this about this project called Shell Performance. Uh, that's one of the projects that I did based on the data. So you can already see somewhere in the middle of the of the well, the middle screen to the the lower part. That's something that well you could probably uh, identify um, as uh, a female person and. Um, 
I was interested in uh, the private data, and especially the private uh, videos and uh, images that were still available on these hard drives. Um, and the more I was interested in that, the more I was disgusted by it. Um, disgusted is specifically um, because it's one of these things that um, sounds interesting when you think about it and sounds like you really learn something from it, but you learn too much too fast, you, you kind of start to feel um, into the identity of uh, not only one identity, but sometimes more identities of the people that were the former owners of the hard drives. Um, and so I decided to just work with the um, material that I found on the hard drives that I could definitely make out to be um, commercial productions, which was still a lot. Um, so, I'm going to show you a video. I um, hope it works. Internet. Yeah. There's no sound. So, the work is, um, is basically a shell script. So, it's a program that runs through the, the contents of the hard drives, which are attached to, um, to, the, to the computer, and spits, well, basically pulls out um, images or stills of videos and um, renders them as uh, in an ASCII fashion just on that screen and it looks a bit like matrix style so you have a little well that's quite hard uh, quite easy to understand what's happening there um, and it puts out all these um, these these files which at some point are pornographic um, mainstream pornographic images the other side are sometimes just party photos of the former owners so it's a very diverse um, and a bit strange um, a collage of a, of a person's life, of a person's digital life that you get. And it's quite unsettling um, in what it evokes in you, uh, I think, when you look at it. So, and in this, oh, where? And in this exhibition, um, there were also a couple of other projects that happened, for example, of that group, Kairos, um, that actually got us the hard drives. Um, they were able with well, actually a lot of effort to identify, well, personally identify um, one of the former owners of one of the hard drives and decided to um, create a project in which they hypothetically send back this hard drive to the former owner. Um, they knew that the hard drive has been discarded about 10 years ago. Um, they still were able to, to figure out the new address because they were able to figure out the new employer of uh, that specific person. And they named this project not a blackmail because, uh, well, they actually don't want to um, send it to the person. But in a gallery, you see it as like the work already basically having the stamps and the, and the uh, address of the person on it. But they're not sending it. Unfortunately. So, um, if I'm talking about the obsolescence of national borders, uh, one thing that um, immediately comes to your mind is satellites. Yeah, satellites. Um, but then, if you think about a much, much older concept than satellites, um, there is shortwave propagation. So, that's, that's now a nice radio frequency phenomenon. That um, well, shortwave radio, you know, it's AM radio, for example. Um, it's old, old school radio that uh, some people still have in their cars, for example. Um, uh, this, this technology is interesting because it's, um, well, first it's meant to be um, uh, for a, let's say, a closer um, space, like for example, a little, little country or a state, so you can have a statewide uh, radio program. But um, it also has this property that it gets reflected from the ionosphere. If you just have an uh, angle which is high enough and you just send the, um, the signal basically to the sky, uh, it gets reflected there and it comes back to Earth and it also gets reflected there again. And then you can, you can basically hop quite far, uh, up to a couple of thousand kilometers um, across Earth. So that's one of the reasons why sometimes, um, especially at night, where propagation um, of radio frequency is, um, is much better than a day, uh, you're able to listen to Chinese radio here, for example, like the Fire, um, fire Dragon, Fire Drake Jammer. So, and then based on this technology, you have um, some other technology. It's called uh, over the horizon radar, for example. 
which is interesting, somehow obsolete um, now after having satellites for reconnaissance, but um, it's still widely used. And over the horizon radar is interesting because it uses this shortwave propagation um, characteristics in order to um, locate um, uh, enemy troops on the ground. And one way how you can use it uh, basically is um, you create these stations in your own territory. You just point them to your enemy territory or just other territory and you get quite a good and close look of uh, what's happening there. Um, there's not only the US that's doing this, um, it's also I think Russia, Japan and Australia have active systems and uh, right now it's actually quite active, one of these um, systems is quite active here in, in uh, Germany but it's coming um, over the horizon from the Russian Federation. So, yeah, and uh, yeah, this is a, also a VLF transmitter. It's called Cutler. It's a, uh, also a U.S. Navy transmitter. By the way, all these images are also taken from the from the U.S. Navy. Um, so one of the reasons why I can use them here because everything that's produced by a governmental agency in the United States is in directly public domain, which is very nice also to to work with. Um, the interesting thing with these uh, very low frequency transmitters, which are usually used to communicate to submarines at the other side of the world, and it works quite well, um, is that they have a very nice geometric structure, like this one, for example. Um, so this geometric structure is usually important for uh, the correct functioning uh, of, of this transmitter. And I was quite uh, happy to see this nice geometry, especially coming from computer science, um, being kind of um, mathematically educated. And, and I somehow wanted to work with that. Um, that's what was coming out of it. It's not that geometrically um, sound, I would say, but it's a project that's now been going on since 2015. It's called Kilohertz, and it's quite an international project. I would say. And uh, this site is right now um, in Brazil. It's somewhere between Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. Um, there's not that much going on there, so it's quite a rural place to be. Um, I created this installation um, in order to listen to uh, specific frequency ranges. So kilohertz is an antenna, and that's something that is quite hard to see. Um, and it's even quite ha harder to see, even if you're standing in front of it, because the, the antenna is um, it looks a bit like this. Um, the antenna is comprised of uh, very fine uh, copper wire, which has a diameter of about 0 0.3 millimeter. So it's almost not, you can almost not see it if you're not standing in front of it and actually know where it is and you can focus with your eye on it. Um, but it apparently is quite good in order to receive um, military radio communications um, and transmissions. And that is what I'm interested in this project is to receive these, um, these military um, radio communications. Um, I was just talking about that shortwave radio because of the propagation um, characteristics is um, an interesting thing to use for, for the military, not only um, for, for this radar, but also, to, for example, to uh, have a unidirective call, um, a channel <laughs> to, uh, um, for example, um, submerged submarines. And um, they, it's also quite, active, quite actively still used for communications um, between uh, military bases. So this happened to be just about 60 kilometers away from a federal police slash military. That's kind of the same thing in, Bra in Brazil. Um, complex that most people don't really know what's going on there. Um, but um, when I was there, I was interested to see if I can actually some, uh, somehow um, get something um, something out of there, if I can actually prove at least that there is some uh, military communication towards this space going on. Um, and it turns out to be, of course, quite hard to do so. Um, but what was really interesting is not only to see how this happens in Brazil, but um, how is that 
everywhere else in the world. Because listening or trying to listen to military communications is legally always a kind of complicated thing. In Brazil, I usually when I give these kind of talks, I say in Brazil they have other problems. They don't need to think about um, somebody uh, receiving military transmissions. They should work on other problems. Um, but uh, in other countries that might be seen in a different way. So I executed this project also in Estonia, just 20 kilometers to the Russian border. Um, I also executed this project in Norway and in Berlin. Actually, there is one active instance running right now in Berlin, always um, listening to the same, basically listening to the same frequency ranges which are um, military classified well, military classified, military frequency ranges that um, you could see or you were able to see just longer ago on one of these slides. So the way how these things, uh, these antennas work is uh, very, very simple. So I take the, basically the simplest way how to build an antenna and, and build it. Um, this is a very, very easy setup. So it just looks like an inverted V. It works quite well for, um, for very potent signals. And the rest of the hardware that you need is very cheap. and the antenna itself is very cheap um, because the only thing you need for the antenna is basically copper wire and for the rest of the um, station uh, a Raspberry Pi with um, a, a little bit of software and a RTL SDR dongle is enough to do it so it costs less than 50 bucks to create a surveillance or counter surveillance stations against these military facilities. There's a couple of other ways how you can actually build these antennas. Um, this again, these, these images are now taken from an, uh, I think it's a Navy field manual. Um, so it's, it's a manual that's given to people in the field for the scenario that their antenna is broken, so they need to build a new one. And I'm kind of using this knowledge against them, which is just an interesting side note, I think. So there's different ways how to build these antennas. They even have that military radio transmitter. Um, that's another way how you could potentially build that. And uh, in the end, you get um, very interesting, nice um, power sweeps, uh, nice images out of it. Uh, they are power sweeps. What that means is um, I'm just defining a frequency range that I'm interested in. And then I basically have a computer program that just goes just step by step and measures the, the uh, intensity of signal that's there and in the end over time, which is the um, y-axis if you want, it creates these uh, images which don't tell you what exactly is going on there, but it uh, gives you proof of that something is going on there and that some communication is taking place. The only thing you have to do then is to verify that it's um, actually a, a military or a civilian um, usage, and you can do that by looking into the, the policies that have to be somehow um, made available to the public, usually through the regulatory institutions in the, in the specific countries, for example, the FCC in the US, um, or what's it in Europe, uh, the Bundesnetzagentur in Germany, which have to publish it in order to make sure that nobody um, interferes with official signals, military or governmental, or signals as part of uh, frequency bands, which have been sold for a lot of money to institutions um, in the country. So I'm... Um, publishing, I think for the first time now, uh, an official call for participation. And I'm doing this because the Kilohertz project, um, I've talked about this project a couple of times already uh, in different countries and um, everybody at these, these places was interested somehow to um, offer two square meters of space to build a little antenna somewhere and to, to push all the uh, information that this antenna spits out into a public GitHub repository and just give out information to, uh, to the rest of the world. And the reason is why should you actually do that? Like what is the real gain in doing that? And one gain is to understand that um, some parts of the frequency spectrum that are reserved to the military and the military has most of the frequency spectrum reserved for it is actually never used. And 
that could also be made available to the public. It uh, could also be made available for resale to commercial um, companies. I'm not in favor of that, but I would like to be kilohertz a project that's able to provide evidence for um, non-usage of um, radio frequency bands in order to um, support groups that are active in um, trying to reclaim parts of the RF frequency spectrum for civilian usage. That would be very nice to have. And there's a couple of initiatives in other countries that already start to, um, to deal with that. But what they always lack is uh, actual information about, um, about the usage of the frequency spectrum that they want to reclaim for the public. So, yeah, if you're interested in that, you can find everything. Well, you have that. So I'm um, just moving on to the next um, section, which is a critical topic of protectionism. And this is a new project that I'm um, presenting to you also, I think for the first time now in, in Germany. It's a, a project which stems from my idea that I actually wanted to go to these fences that are everywhere right now in Europe. Um, fences that were supposed to protect us from an influx of I don't know what. And uh, they are, well, especially um, prevalent in Slovenia and in places around Slovenia. So I went there for a residency and uh, first went to the um, fence between Slovenia and Austria. This is from the Slovenian side, um, obviously, so it has this um, police marker on there, and it's quite a solid, if you want, so fence. It actually says, if you want to go through, you please call us and we let you through. It obviously is not um, valid for non-citizens, but uh, it's interesting because they really cut through all um, the very, very nice um, hiking trails. And as I'm an active hiker, I'm kind of um, saddened to see these kind of things. But at the same time, you have a street just 200 meters of that, um, which goes through the border and it doesn't have a fence. So I don't really understand what's going on there, but they were very happy to build these fence. Um, and now they have it there and don't know what to do with it. So. Um, so I took this trip to the fence and did some field research. Um, what I'm doing there is I was measuring conductivity of uh, the fence um, because it's a, it's a metal construct, right? And I was also measuring the um, potential towards, towards ground to see if I have a, um, a short circuit there or not, if I can work with it somehow. Um, just to give you an idea of where that is, it's actually somewhere. You see Ljubljana there in Zagreb, it's kind of half the way, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's a little uh, village called Lastnich, and um, where the next, actually, the next video was taking place. Uh, I'm just going to show you a little excerpt. As the Migration Summit kicks off in Malta, Slovenia has started erecting a wire fence along its border with Croatia to help control the flow of people arriving daily. Last year, authorities rolled out more than 150 kilometers of barbed wire to stave off an influx of migrants, which never came. Stories abound in the villages here of farmers having land cut in two, of bears and deer cut to ribbons, of kids falling off their bikes into the wire, and yet nobody has ever seen a refugee. So that last sentence is actually quite important because they built this barbed wire, this razor wire fence, which is stacked razor wire military grade um, for this border between Slovenia and, and Croatia for zero refugees that ever even attempted to cross the border there. So they now have this huge fence, which is absolutely useless. Um, and you just have animals um, that get somehow into the fence and then die um, being in, inside of this fence, or at least um, get... Uh, get hurt a lot, um, but you still have this fence and everybody's kind of disgusted by this fence. So I thought that's quite lovely. I just should just go there and see what I can do. And if I can do something, so I went to this fence. Um, let me see, that looks like this then. And I um, did the same thing again, measured conductivity, measured ground potential of the fence um, to get somehow an overview of how I could use the fence for um, an electronic uh, intervention, to say it like this. And 
Finally, um, this is almost a religious position. I like that somehow. Um, finally, I built a little device. That's something that's hanging around there. It's, it's very, very rudimental. Has been almost basically built on site. Uh, it's a little, um, a little transmitter and an amplifier hanging at at the border fence and the other one in the ground. That's just one meter there. Doesn't really matter. It was a proof of concept um, to send a, a signal over. Um, over this fence. So I was interested in seeing how can you use this defensive architecture, which is really just there to make sure people can not be together, um, basically. How can you use that as um, a network infrastructure, just to be honest? Um, how can you just use that? Because it's conductive material um, already lying there for free. Why not use it for something actually useful, or at least try to see if, uh, if we could do something actually useful with it? Um, it ended up in a project uh, called Razor Wire Modem of this year. It's um, a still somehow a work in progress because uh, the modem part got a little uh, omitted in the process of being there in Slovenia. In Slovenia, it was really just a transmitter and one receiver. The transmitter was um, sending some data on this fence, and then you had a receiver taking the data from the fence. They were connected through a ground return um, in the actual soil, so that you have the two connections that you need. And I was sending data through this fence, and I actually sent the Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, through the fence. <laughs> um, especially Article 14, um, everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum for persecution. So I want to talk to you very briefly um, about new modes of activism. I already, I already said that it's programming is the modern and the new form of activism and has to be understood as that. Programming is something that you should learn right now from, from primary school as soon as possible because it's just the way how to express in our modern world and actually how to be a bit of a step ahead of the regulators. And coming to regulation, that's going to get important. Um, you have something that I would call techno-regulation, which is the regulation of technology, um, which plays a lot of roles, especially two. It's making sure technology functions as intended. So planes should, for example, not fall from the sky. Um, radio frequency, radio applications should not interfere with each other. That's quite important. And also making sure technology will, will function in the future in somehow predictive ways. So this is a problem for me, especially the predictive ways, because um, it limits freedom of expression. And um, it's also a future-oriented policy that uh, serves the goal, again, to predict some future scenarios. So there's, of course, counterexamples um, of things that oppose this techno-regulation. For example, peer-to-peer -peer protocols, anonymity networks, or decentralized cryptographic currencies, as an example. Um, but it's not enough yet. So the next topic that directly um, speaks to me um, in that whole realm is quantification, because it's, it is directly related to the regulation of technology, um, because it's basically the understanding or the trial to understand every occurrence of something in the world and to understand that as a signal that has to be processed, stored, and later analyzed. And it happens on all levels, uh, this quantification, not only analog to digital conversion, but the creation of symbols from electronic impulses, and then in, to in, induce structure on the symbols, for example, over predefined protocols, or just learned, like in predictive analysis. I just talked about that. The question is here, um, who is the enemy? Um, I would say the enemy is, um, everybody who sees us as their enemy, um, which is not really a solid definition. Um, but I, I want to make sure that the enemy is not the institutions that create the policies, but it's the policy itself. So I'm not against the state if I'm building a system that deals with the policies that have been created by the people in the state, but I'm against that policy in the first place. Uh, and that's quite important to me. 
So I talked to you about Laplace's demon, and I think if I stick together these two concepts of techno-regulation and quantification, I get Laplace's demon. Um, it's an internal justification mechanism for complete surveillance, if you want so. Um, it's the old concept of the world formula, and I was, I was telling you, I'm telling you about the world formula, and it's dangerous because it creates a loop. I will give you one example is if you have a predictive system, which is built on some models of the world, um, it will predict somehow within this model, and the more correct the predictions get, the more you will understand that if we change the world according to the prediction of this model, then we will be better at understanding our world. So why not just change the world to our model, at least in, a, in, a, in some sense, not very actively in saying, okay, we should make our world a lot easier or a lot well, more, uh, more formal, um, but I think that's something that happens already. And um, I said I'm coming from computer science, a bit mathematics, and in statistics, we have a term for the outcome of this process, and we call it overfitting. So techno-regulation and quantification somehow lead to an overfitting of the world formula. I just want to show you two outcomes, what it means to apply this world formula, which basically creates uh, a justification for everything, is um, something that... Um, we heard in the news for a long time, uh, Iraq's weapons of mass destruction. Um, that's uh, some of the, or one outcome of the application of the world formula um, that you trust a, um, um, a, uh, a secret service um, because it's the secret service, it should know this, these kind of things. And the other thing that can happen if you apply this world formula is of course, also extremism in the other way. Um, and in this sense, I wanted to quote, not really quote, but show you this because I was, I was interested when I read about that. It's, uh, it's a kind of a security bulletin published on the Internet Archive um, in November 2016. And the general scope, I will tell you about it, is how can you use information technology to conceal extremist activity? Um, and of course, they are using the same, somehow the same uh, visual metaphors that also the um, the Bundeswehr in German is using. So, but I don't want to end this talk on this very depressing topic because kind of the application of the world formula is actually a depressing thing. And I would urge you to understand that we have to do something against that. I want to quote something against that. We have grown, but there's still much to be done. Many that live in darkness then must be shown the way for it is the dawning of a new day. Thanks. Martin Reiche. <lacht> um, Martin Reiche. Oh. Jetzt geht's. Jetzt geht's. Jetzt geht's. Martin Reiche, vielen Dank. Um, any questions? German or English? In German or in English, feel free to attend one of our microphone stands. No questions. No questions. Well then, let's go home. <lacht> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Martin Reiche.